Hey friends, welcome back for another episode for this series on becoming a future ready church for Exponential Next. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about another shift. Uh, and this shift is particularly about helping churches to th- go from thinking from the mind only to the soul, from mind to soul. And we're asking the question why the future uh, of the church or why the future is birthing a new apologetic. Why do we need one? Uh, and how is that actually happening and emerging? Uh, there's a sense from today's uh, younger generation that the church at times is trying to answer questions that they aren't asking, or at least they're not asking with the same urgency that previous generations were asking. That's not to say that the debates and questions that boomers and Xers were having when it comes to faith, it's not to say that that's not substantial or valid, but the urgency in which they felt it is being felt less by uh, emerging and younger generations. Some of us might remember uh, the popularity of debates between Christian apologists and atheistic professors. I went to the University of Michigan, and back in 1996, when I first started, it was a huge thing to fill out an auditorium. And they aimed to explain the basics of the Christian faith uh, in an in a, in a intellectual framework. And church leaders were discovering something uh, even deeper uh, than intellectual doubts today. And many of us, as we're having conversations with our emerging generation or emerging leaders and Gen Z leaders, uh, we're realizing that the suspicions, that there's suspicions about the authenticity and the goodness of our institutions and the authorities underneath them. And one of the ways to address those suspicions is to demonstrate through various forms of outreach that the gospel can be used to help heal social and spiritual trauma. Friends, my name is Daniel Yang, I'm National Director of Churches of Welcome at World Relief. And Daniel, that was a lot to set us up, and we're going to unpack it further, but uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Warren Bird. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research at ECFA, the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, and I'm also the author or co-author of 35 books for church leaders. And I'm Adele Banks, veteran religion journalist. I'm the projects editor and a national reporter at Religion News Service. And we have the wonderful journey of writing a book together uh, called Becoming a Future Ready Church, Eight Shifts to Encourage and Empower the Next Generation of Leaders that was released by Zonervan in October 2024. And Daniel, those uh, debates, academic debates that you mentioned, there are many reasons why they've been effective. Uh, the Gen Xer and millennial students to whom those events were targeted were likely to be the children of boomer parents, boomer parents who had some kind of Christian heritage, uh, as, as therefore did their kids. But today, the research says that one out of three young adults and increasing has no belief in God. And we can also no longer assume that people will remain in the faith traditions of their birth, which makes the setting for apologetics a very different context for the unchanging gospel. Yeah, that's right, Warren. As as we think about history, you know, so much of the, again, I I mentioned in 1996, 97, I started my freshman year at University of Michigan. And as I was listening to those debates, I remember William Lane Craig was debating one of our anthropology professors. Uh, They were hearkening back to evolution and those things that, Really, in the early uh, 20th century, uh, at the end of the 19th century, these debates have begun emerging. And then at the Scopes Monkey Trial, that was really when we began seeing this spill into the public. And it's not like those debates have been settled. It's not that those debates no longer uh, matter. But the intensity of those debates really were a part of this larger cultural war which was a schism, at least within the church, between fundamentalists and the, the modernists. And that was a, essentially a, a, a internal conflict within the church. It started with the Presbyterian church, but it be, began a part of all other uh, Christian uh, denominations. Began this sort of like dichotomy between there are those that are conservative and those that are liberal, those that believe the Bible too much and those that don't believe the Bible enough. And um, the aftermath of that is you have now uh, a full generation Christian millennials that spent their lives watching this culture war take place. Uh, And it wasn't just happening in American society. It was happening within their churches and sometimes within their local church. 
And to them, a lot of the arguments began to feel less about faith and the beautiful truths of the gospel, and it felt more about power grabs. Uh, and then at the same time, many liberals and many conservative Christians began demonizing each other and criticizing each other. And instead, they should have been asking, you know, how do we behave uh, as uh, Jesus followers amid some of these controversies? And that might have been a better posture to have uh, for younger generations to watch this conflict unfold. And Warren, I mean, we talk a lot about some of these uh, questions and some of these pains that uh, that uh, really form the the new gospel defense. Uh, kind of dig in a little bit more as to how what we talk about in the book. Yeah, and and again, Daniel, you're covering so much ground here, and and the reason you're doing it is because all of our chapters talk about a shift in this case from mind to soul, but then the subtitle of every single chapter begins with the word "why." <laughs> why is this happening? And in this particular chapter, why is the future birthing a new apologetic? And we unfold the shift by saying, kind of comparing two questions. The dated question is, how do we convince unchurched friends to develop more interest in spiritual things? And 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 I grew up that way of, of you know, talking to people and and about their curiosities about what happens after death and and their spiritual life. And for whatever reason, that's just not for so many people what they're laying in bed thinking about. Hmm. The better question today to get to the same Jesus behind the apologetic might be something like, how can we enter more into people's pain and show them the God who cares? The trend here being that the proclaiming of truth, not by winning an intellectual debate, as important as our mind is, but by showing and sharing how the gospel heals social and spiritual trauma. Daniel, uh, give us kind of some movements that might give evidence of these shifts going on. Yeah, for example, one of those movements are the hashtag movements that we, we've seen emerge over the last decade or so. Uh, they were a digital interpretation of internal turmoils that were essentially waiting to happen within different sectors of society, the entertainment, business, virtually every social institution, including the church. So there was the hashtag Me Too movement. Uh, that was a reflection for almost every institution in America. It was eventually followed by a hashtag Church Two and then hashtag Denomination Two, yeah, SBC Two, PCNA Two, PCA Two, uh, specific hashtags that were related to stories of Christian women and girls that experience abuse, sometimes at the hands of church leaders. Hard, hard stories, hard stories. And this was, in a sense, uh, I'll use the word reckoning. This was a reckoning or what Hebrews 12, verse 27 says. It was the removal of things that are being shaken. Uh, hashtag movements weren't, they weren't just like social media trends. They were actually the surface of fault lines that were in our culture, but then also in the church. And I share these stories. Um, it's it's a hard one to to swallow, but it's it's actually what is happening that I feel like uh, Gen Zers are seeing. They have become sensitized to these things, not desensitized, but they become sensitized to these things. And in a sense, in a good way, it's holding church leaders accountable to become a pure uh, church for the future. And I think that's a healthy thing, even if we don't always get it right. I think it's a healthy thing. I think it's what God is doing to heal the body. And again, it leads to an apologetic, a door for being able to uh, talk about the gospel. Whether people are dealing with trauma or other kinds of hurts or pain, whether they're believers or skeptics, they need space where they can ask questions based on their experiences. And empathetic Christian listeners can give them the kind of attention that they they will respond to and be helped by. So in each chapter, we try to tell an in-depth story of a church that's making that kind of transition. And Adele, you wrote a story in the in our book, Becoming a Future Ready Church, about one church's effort to listen 
openly to people who are unfamiliar with the basics of Christianity. <laughs> and and th those settings create some interesting dialogue. Can you tell us about that? Yes, Lauren, thanks. One of the stories I wrote featured Coastal Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. Just as we discussed how academic debates may not be the solution for evangelism in this period of time, the leaders of that church tried different methods of Christian outreach before they found one that worked for them. Pastors David and Cheryl Coop told me they felt called to start a church in a neighborhood where less than 3% of the community considered themselves to be churchgoers. They were told it couldn't be done. And at first it was, it was really hard. But then they trial Alpha, a 10 week evangelistic course that has been around for decades, but remains an effective option for churches to this day. Cheryl Coop described to me how church facilitators of the Alpha course are instructed beforehand to be open to whatever is said in what they want to be a safe setting where participants watch short videos, discuss the Bible and or their impressions of Christianity. One of the things she said to me was, the facilitator is to say, that's interesting, not to say that's wrong. The Bible doesn't say that, you've got it wrong. So they are instructed to say, that's interesting, and then pass the ball to someone else in the group, asking something like, what do you think about that? David Coop said, another part of the Alpha course is food. Whether pizza for a group of high schoolers, food on paper plates at a church location, or a meal with a nice touch in the common room of a high rise building. He said the small groups that meet over a meal are tackling one of the greatest needs in his community, addressing loneliness. The Coops describe attendees of the Alpha Group as people of a range of ages, though the 30s are the ones that predominate, and they are a range of faiths. Some have been raised Muslim or Hindu or Sikh, but often not practicing the faith of their birth. More reflect the demographics of about 50% of Vancouver residents that have no religious affiliation. The Coops say attendance in Alpha courses produces a range of results. Some continue to ask questions, some become Christians, some take part in coastal churches service projects in Canada or abroad. And while some facilitators of Alpha courses move on to leading other small groups at Coastal Church, the Coops say some attendees take the 10 week course more than once. And they said church members can invite friends and family to the course and sit with them in the small groups. As Cheryl Coop put it, not to preach to them, but just to be there alongside them. Wow, what a great story. Um, Daniel, how do you see these two kinds of groups playing a role in church outreach, especially to young adults? In the book, we show lots of research, such as the in this cha particular chapter, the rapid rise of people who identify as having no religious affiliation. And just as the coops are experiencing in Vancouver, that doesn't mean a lack of interest in the supernatural, a higher power, or even the God of Scripture. But it does say that we need to reach out to them in different ways than in previous than with previous generations. Yeah, there, there's a, there's an apologetic uh, that we're trying to get at here that uh, really describes something that is both heads on, but, the, but then also hands on. And uh, what what we mean by that is uh, we have to see our witness as a mutual exchange of word indeed uh, spaces. And that's really what the story about the coops, not just what they did with alpha, but what they did with their church was it became a place where they could mutually exchange word. Indeed. When I say mutual mutual usually means there's two parties. There's someone who maybe is following Jesus and somebody who is not yet following Jesus. Um, and so how do they mutually enter into a space where they're both serving each other through word, and they're both serving each other through deed. It's that interconnectedness, and it's that equal space that they step into. That The ability to be able to create those spaces, and Alpha is just one of those spaces, but the ability to create those spaces where people can come in as peers, people can come in to serve one another, regardless of where they're coming from spiritually. People can come and share their opinion and share their, uh, their stories and share what they believe um, as peers is a very important part of how we do evangelism moving forward. And so in the book, we actually provide sort of a, a visual model for us to think through this and what's required to move from uh, one stage to the next stage. Because sometimes it's your turn to serve. Sometimes it's your turn to receive. Uh, 
Sometimes it's your turn to speak. Sometimes it's your turn to listen. And that model, I think, is going to be really crucial for how we think about apologetics for the future. Uh, This has been a really uh, important uh, conversation, and I'm so glad that we have worked on this together, Warren and Adele, and I'm so glad that we get to share this with you all that are listening here uh, this uh, on whenever it is that you're listening. So thanks again for joining us for this episode of Exponential's uh, next series on becoming a future ready church. We hope you'll check out some of the other episodes that you can find on Exponential's YouTube channel.